Hi everyone, it's Katrina. New things are being found all the time that change the way we look at the past. From the fall of the Roman Empire to cavemen building ships and even aliens, here are some of the most amazing discoveries that could change history. Giant Desert Figures In the middle of nowhere in the desert in California, there are some very strange figures carved in the dirt. These giant figures might just be one of the greatest wonders in the world. To get here, you have to go about 16 miles from the town of Blythe near the California-Arizona border and then down a dirt road. If you like small towns and rocks and desert stuff, this place is for you. Nobody knows who made the giant desert figures here in California. But when scientists finally figure it out, there is no doubt that American history will be changed forever. They are officially called the Blythe Intaglios. Maybe you've been there? If you have, let us know in the comments and if we should add it to our travel list. The Blythe Intaglios is not a single wonder, but a group of humongous drawings. Forget the Nazca lines, you can just come here. It's hard to call them drawings considering their scope. They were made a very long time ago by an unknown group of people who spent time carving away the top layers of the ground to form these bizarre images. Just like the Nazca lines in Peru, the California geoglyphs consist of anthropomorphic figures and geometric patterns. There are humanoid figures with really long arms and legs and then others with deer inside large shapes. It's hard to know what the figures are supposed to be. Are they ancient gods, leaders that passed? Of course, others guess it was aliens. From the ground, they don't look like much. It's only when you look from the sky that you can truly appreciate them and get a sense of how magnificent the geoglyphs are. Who were they for? That's another mystery. They were discovered in the 1930s and still scientists are at a loss. It's no surprise they went unnoticed for so long. It just looks like a dry, barren landscape. You can see them if you know they're there, but not if you're just wandering around. The group of geoglyphs in Blythe is only one of many, and the most famous because of the unusual human-like figures. Some of these figures are up to 170 feet long. But across the southwestern United States, there are about 600 intaglios in total. As for their history, it's completely unknown. It's believed the Blythe and Taglios were made by Native Americans that lived along the Colorado River. It's hard to know how old they are since they could be anywhere from 450 to 2,000 years old, which is quite a big range. Their similarities to the Nazca lines are hard to ignore. Were these ground carvings made to speak to the ancestors or to the gods themselves? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. And now for a quick break, but first, it's shout out time. I want to give a big thank you to Paul Wells and Donnie Simmons for supporting this channel. Thanks so much for watching and spending time with us. Be sure to subscribe if you are new here for more videos about amazing discoveries. The Fall of an Empire How often do you think about the Roman Empire? If you forgot today, here is some new information for you. For the last 13 years, archaeologists have been steadily excavating a site in central Italy that will change the way you think about the fall of the Roman Empire. This site itself is about 100 miles from Rome and doesn't look like anything at all really. It's just fields and farms and I can't really show you much right now. So what's so great about that? Well, this place was poppin' in the 3rd century. It was actually an entire thriving city, and recently archaeologists unveiled the ruins of a theater that could change everything. How can an old theater do that? 1,700 years ago, the Roman Empire began to unravel. There was civil war, which would be kind of enough already. But on top of that, there were invasions from barbarian hordes and political corruption. So the great empire was weakening from all sides. It was always assumed that as Rome fell into chaos, the lives of ordinary Romans became miserable, but that might not be the case. The newest discoveries from Italy show ordinary people were still living the good life, even as Rome slowly went downhill. The city that's been excavated has no name. It was one of dozens of mid-sized Roman cities across Italy that time has slowly forgotten. When experts began their investigations, there wasn't a single piece of this city above the surface. All of it was underground, buried and broken beneath the fields. 
Again, there's not much to show, but just picture it. Over the past decade and a half, experts have uncovered a marketplace, a warehouse, a temple, and now a theater. The theater is very interesting because it was built in the third century, at the same time the Roman Empire was crumbling. It wasn't just a simple theater, but an elaborate building that could seat 1,500 people. That's about the size of the Apollo Theater in New York. Dr. Alessandro Launaro from Cambridge University said it was the type of building to show off the wealth and power of an ambitious city. After all, if you have time for some shows, things must not be that bad. So how does any of this change history? Based on the theater, scientists know the people of this nameless city were still prospering when Rome was in decline. The people of the Roman Empire may not have plunged into poverty and strife as quickly as previously thought. In the streets and homes of the empire, people kept on living normal lives until the bitter end. Sahura's Pyramid Sahura's Pyramid is one of the saddest looking pyramids in the world. It's not quite as old as the Great Pyramid of Giza, but it's in way worse shape. The pyramid was built in honor of Pharaoh Sahura during the 5th dynasty, roughly a century after Khufu's death. But to be honest, you wouldn't even know it was a pyramid by looking at it. The crumbling remnants of the pyramid have been overlooked by archaeologists for decades. It's an amazing structure, but it doesn't capture the imagination in the way that the other pyramids do. Still, a team of scientists from Germany recently decided to uncover its secrets. They went inside the pitiful, crumbling monument and found a hidden room. Actually, not just one, but a few hidden rooms. Researchers discovered a number of storage chambers never seen by living human eyes. Dr. Mohammed Ismail Khaled called the discovery groundbreaking. He thinks that if archaeologists can just understand the Sahura Pyramid a little bit better, they will reveal previously unknown knowledge of ancient Egypt. Pharaoh Sahura is not a household name when it comes to Egyptian pharaohs. He was the very first ruler to be buried at the necropolis of Abu Sir. It's also believed that he had a peaceful and prosperous reign, trading with foreign lands and opening many mines. His pyramid was initially excavated in 1836, but largely ignored until now. When scientists entered the tragically destroyed structure, finding secret rooms was not their goal. They wanted to stabilize the substructure to stop the pyramid from collapsing. When they used 3D laser scans to survey the interior, they identified a secret passage. Following the passage brought them to eight secret storerooms. Sadly, the rooms are empty, likely pillaged thousands of years ago. Now, the team of scientists is on a mission to uncover what was held in the eight giant chambers beneath the pyramid. Did they have treasure? Were they full of mummies? Sahura's pyramid is one of the greatest mysteries being unraveled right now in the world of Egyptology. Some think it's even more exciting than what's happening in Cairo. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Obsidian Orbs some very unusual artifacts were recently discovered off the coast of Italy. Here we go, in Italy once again. The artifacts are small, orb-like chunks of volcanic glass known as obsidian. What makes them so interesting is that scientists think they may have been cargo on a Neolithic ship. Neolithic as in Stone Age. Researchers think they have found actual artifacts from what could have been a merchant vessel cruising the seas 8,000 years ago. The implications of this discovery are huge. As far as we know right now, humans weren't building boats during the same time they were living in caves. Maybe they had canoes or some primitive seafaring rafts. But to imagine Neolithic humans setting sail with a cargo of volcanic glass is ludicrous. Crazy as it may be, the evidence doesn't lie. Obsidian was an extremely important material to ancient people all over the world. You could use it to look directly at the sun to monitor solar movements, and it was sharp and great for weapons. It was the underwater unit of the Naples police who found the submerged remains. That seems like a cool job, right? Not just regular police, but the underwater unit police. 
Anyway, the artifacts were located about 100 feet deep in the Bay of Naples, not far from a sea cave called the White Grotto. The government released an official press release where they said the artifacts were likely part of a cargo ship. The remains of a ship have yet to be found, probably since whatever it was made of is now long dissolved. But at least the possible cargo is still around. Some believe the artifacts were put in a small canoe and sent to sink as an offering to the gods. The artifacts may have come from a small canoe boat that got caught in a storm. Right now, historians are so shocked by the idea of a Neolithic cargo vessel, they can't even stand it. The Bondo Apes In 2003, rumors began circulating of a mysterious species of ape living in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The apes were supposedly highly advanced, incredibly intelligent, and savvy enough to slay lions. Many believe that these apes are a missing link between humans and primates. But do they even exist? If they do, every book on evolution would have to be rewritten. However, there isn't much evidence right now. The only supposed proof of these highly advanced apes has been a point of controversy since 1996. It was three decades ago that Carl Amann discovered a strange skull in the Royal Museum for Central Africa. The skull had been brought back from the Congo, but there was little else in the way of meaningful information. It looked like the skull of a chimpanzee, but there was something different about it. It also had attributes of a gorilla. It appeared to be from a gorilla chimp mix, something that has never been seen before. Experts in primatology suggested this skull belonged to a new, never before seen species. They named it the Bondo Ape. Carl Amann became obsessed. He made it his goal to find proof of the Bondo Ape, trying to single handedly change history. He gathered his crew, got on a plane, and journeyed into the great unknown. In the 1990s, the Congo was still largely unexplored and mysterious to most. Of course, not the people who lived there, but everybody else. Carl traveled deep into the jungle, spoke with locals, and heard some crazy stories. Villagers said that yes, there was a monstrous ape living in the forest. The apes were strong enough to kill lions with their bare hands. They were also immune to the most toxic poisoned arrows shot at them by hunters. The more Carl investigated, the more it seemed that Bondo apes were real. He truly felt that he was on the edge of identifying a living ape hybrid. It never worked out though. The only thing the team found in the jungle were eastern chimpanzees. There was no living missing link. At the same time, the scientists did find something amazing. Genetically, the eastern chimpanzee is a totally ordinary chimp. But the ones that Carl found in the Congo were unique. Based on his own knowledge, and the knowledge of top primatologists in the field, he made an exciting claim. It appears the Congo chimpanzees are in the midst of evolving. The human-like behavior that they exhibit suggests that they are in the process of changing and becoming smarter. Using more stuff, maybe they'll start making arrows for hunting or drawing on cave walls. They aren't there yet, but scientists say it's like watching evolution in slow motion. The Six-Headed Chief Scientists are struggling to identify the remains of a six-headed chief discovered buried in Scotland. But who was this ancient chief? And why did he have six heads with him? In 1997, near the altar of an old parish church in a fishing village, archaeologists uncovered a grave. To this day, it's one of the weirdest graves ever found. A single man was buried with six human skulls. He's known only as the Six-Headed Chief. Appropriate. For the last roughly 30 years, scientists assumed it was one man buried with five additional skulls, perhaps the skulls of his enemies. But a new DNA analysis is finally revealing some clues. The skulls actually say the opposite. They share some DNA similarities with the dead man, suggesting they were members of his extended family. It also turns out that while it seems like it was one man buried with a bunch of other heads, the body is actually bodies, plural. So two men were buried here together around the 14th century. They were most likely cousins or perhaps an uncle with his nephew, but what about the rest? 
Three of the other four skulls were also from the same family. There was the grandfather and father of the chief, and then mother of the second man. So maybe an aunt or a sister? I'm starting to lose track of who's who, but they didn't. They must have known exactly what they were doing and were buried together for a reason. So everyone was basically family, but the fourth skull does not fit at all. This is where things get even weirder. Archaeologists were somehow able to trace the fourth skull to a Pictish monk who lived at least 300 years before the chief. They don't know why the monk's skull was taken from his grave and moved into the chief's weird collection of skulls to be buried with him. They think for some reason, someone in the family took this monk's skull and then kept it around as a relic or a prized possession. I'm sure that was an interesting story too. It's too complicated and weird to explain right now, but all of this would probably make a great movie. So we have the chief's body and skull, his nephew slash cousin's body and skull, four other skulls that I just covered, and then the last one that he was buried with, nobody knows anything about. In any case, the six-headed chief is quite a complicated story. Also, I haven't told you just how strange the discovery is in a historical context. Archaeologist Cecily Spall said that putting skulls in a person's grave was unheard of in Scotland during the Middle Ages. This just wasn't something that people did. Sometimes people did it in the Bronze Age or the Stone Age, but that was thousands of years earlier. It wasn't totally uncommon for ancient people to worship severed body parts from family members and want to be buried with them. But in the Middle Ages and with new religious practices and all of that, people just didn't do that. As Spall said, in the medieval period, harvesting the graves of your parents and grandparents for body parts and then putting them into a contemporary burial is about as unusual as it gets. Alien Hunter Harvard astrophysicist Avi Loeb has been trying to convince the world that aliens are real for years. He's always talking about interstellar objects, alien artifacts, and UFOs. He even traveled to Papua New Guinea recently, where he found a very unusual artifact. An artifact that he says comes from a spaceship. Is Avi Loeb changing history? Let's take a look at the scientist first, and then his alleged discovery of aliens on Earth. Abby lives in a mansion in Lexington, Massachusetts. It's one of the richest boroughs in the entire United States of America. He has a one-man show about his life and his work. He's also in talks for a Netflix show. Avi is a man who clearly enjoys the spotlight, don't we all? But he is also a distinguished scientist with hundreds of published papers under his belt and a best-selling book on aliens. Avi was the one who said that Oumuamua was likely an alien-made object when it passed through our solar system in 2017. It was the same year the Pentagon admitted to spending millions of dollars a year on investigating unidentified flying objects. Off the coast of Papua New Guinea, Avi and his team of scientists pulled some spherules from the bottom of the sea. These are allegedly objects from outside the solar system, rained down from the sky in 2014. Avi claimed they were not made by human hands. He said they didn't come from asteroids or from anything known to science. Instead, he believed that tiny particles came from some sort of alien device. If true, it means that aliens are definitely out there. It could mean the human species is nothing but the creation of curious aliens. Then again, the spherules could be nothing but tiny globs of coal ash. Hmm. I don't know. <laughs> Humans in Siberia The ancient history of civilization in Siberia is being rewritten as we speak. Up until now, it was believed the East Siberian taiga was populated by hunter-gatherers in prehistoric times. Obviously not taiga the rapper, but taiga as in T-A-I-G-A. These humans, lacking complex tools and social skills, roamed the forest with pointy sticks looking for meat. But that's not the case. Archaeologists recently studied a group of settlements uncovered in eastern Russia. It turns out the settlements are from 8,000 years ago, making them older than any of the cities ever found in Europe. Scientists don't know what to think anymore. For decades, the hypothesis was that civilized society started with the invention of agriculture. Up until people learned to farm, 
farm, they had no reason to stay in one place. It was only through farming and animal husbandry that complicated social structures started to form. Agriculture allowed the very first settlements to be built, followed by towns and cities, followed by kingdoms and empires. In Russia, that's not the true history. These ancient settlements, known as Amya I and Amya II, are majorly old, twice as old as the pyramids and older than Stonehenge. The settlements aren't basic either. Each one had about 20 houses, with the perimeter fortified by a series of stakes and trenches. Artifacts found within the settlements include tools and pieces of pottery, weapons, projectiles, deadly blades. Archaeologists also found evidence of war. The houses in the settlement had been burned and rebuilt several times. It looks as if the inhabitants were attacked by outsiders, hence why they constructed a perimeter of stakes and ditches. All evidence points to warring societies in Russia. This was 2,000 years before similar societies existed in Europe. Looks like hunter-gatherers weren't as simple as we thought. Trees of the past What did early forests of the planet look like? What types of trees towered above the forest floor in the days when animals had yet to slither out of the ocean and grow legs? These questions are a lot harder to answer than you might think. Although trees originated hundreds of millions of years ago, scientists know very little about them. But that's starting to change, thanks to some incredible fossils discovered in Canada. In the province of New Brunswick, five fossilized trees buried in an earthquake 350 million years ago were found. Scientists believe the tree fossils could reveal the truth of one of Earth's most mysterious eras. Robert Castaldo, a paleontologist involved in the study, said trees are time capsules. Trees provide a glimpse into the ancient ecosystems of the world. 350 million years ago takes us to the Paleozoic era. So far, we have only documented about six trees from that entire time period. There were likely hundreds, maybe thousands, maybe tens of thousands. But scientists have only identified six of them. The trees found in the past have all been small and not very leafy. The fossilized trees from Canada were huge. When I say huge, I mean about 15 feet tall. These trees had nothing on the redwood trees of today, but they were giants compared to other prehistoric trees. Finding them has proven that we don't know a whole lot about the world's early forests. In case you were wondering, this new plant is called Sanfordia Kallus, the Lost Tribes of Israel. A collection of incredible stone artifacts was recently shipped to Israel to undergo scientific testing. The artifacts were sent across the world from Puerto Rico, but their origin isn't in the Americas. The stone artifacts are believed to have been made by a group of Jewish people connected to the 10 Lost Tribes tribes of Israel. How did artifacts made by a lost ancient tribe end up on the island of Puerto Rico? The answer takes us back to the 19th century. It's a story that sounds so unbelievable, it might just be true. A monk by the name of Jose Maria Nazario was invited to the hut of a mysterious old woman in the mountains. The strange old woman weaved for him an exciting tale. Her family had been guarding a collection of statues for centuries. The statues had been buried in a secret pit and covered over with a humongous stone. Only people from the woman's family knew the exact location of the pit and the treasure it held. The woman gave the monk the directions to the pit, where he did indeed find the statues. He collected 800 impressively carved stone figures that clearly had not been made in Puerto Rico. It was his understanding they had come from members of the Lost Tribes. In the years since, scientists have struggled to understand the stones. Many people assumed the monk had forged them himself as part of a bizarre hoax. It wasn't until the 21st century that scientists were able to confirm the objects are indeed ancient. Now researchers know exactly when they came from. In Israel, the Use Wear Analysis Laboratory specializes in ancient artifacts. Scientists at the lab know how to tell which tools were used to craft an object. They can figure out what material was used in the creation, and they can pinpoint an exact date. The lab director confirmed the objects were carved 
carved in the 16th century. She even found evidence that the statues were originally painted gold and red. But that's only the start of the weirdness. The objects are so strange that never before have similar things been found in the Americas. The statues bear no resemblance to anything developed by the Aztec or the Maya. Could these artifacts really have been created by one of the lost tribes of Israel? And for that matter, who are the lost tribes? In 722 BC, the Kingdom of Israel was conquered by the Neo-Assyrian Empire. The twelve tribes who called Israel home were kicked to the curb, exiled to roam the wilderness. Only two of those tribes were ever seen again, with the other ten vanishing into historical obscurity. It's been rumored for centuries that the re-emergence of the lost tribes is directly connected to the coming of the Messiah. Could ancient descendants of Israel have made it to Puerto Rico and carved these statues 600 years ago? Nobody really knows. Michigan Stonehenge On Michigan's Beaver Island, there are 39 stones that form an enormous circle, nearly 400 feet wide. The stones vary in size. Some are bigger than others, and some are so eroded they're melting. The circle is incredible because it has no parallel in America. There just aren't any stone circles like this around. The mysterious monument has more in common with stone circles found across Europe. It's for this reason that author Mark Jaeger believes it was an ancient civilization that created the stone circle. Maybe the Vikings, maybe Egyptians, or maybe even the Druids of Stonehenge era England. But what about the Native Americans? Isn't it totally possible a group of indigenous people erected the stone circle thousands of years ago? Yes, it certainly is. But the stone circles don't seem very indigenous. When you look at most indigenous sites in America, you're looking at things like medicine wheels, not giant circles of standing stones. The mysterious Michigan monument is distinctly European. Then again, maybe it isn't a monument at all. Some mainstream scientists have denounced the Beaver Island Henge as nothing but a glacial deposit. In other words, stones that were pushed by a retreating glacier until they ended up sitting in a circle. It could be an incredible coincidence, but not everyone is convinced. There is speculation that an unknown group sailed from Europe to Michigan in the distant past. But what could have happened to them? Let me know your thoughts about all this in the comments below. The Ubaid Lizardmen Check out the Al Ubaid figurines. These bizarre statues are 7,000 years old, crafted by a mysterious pre-Sumerian society. They look exactly like what you would imagine reptilian overlords to look like. Many believe these statues are proof that the world is secretly controlled by hyper-intelligent reptiles from another planet. The Ubaid period was Mesopotamia's Stone Age. The Sumerians were the ones who kickstarted civilization, but the Ubaid kickstarted the Sumerians. They appeared from seemingly nowhere and started building villages and simplistic towns. They learned how to create mud bricks and stack them into houses. It was during this period that the earliest public architecture was invented, along with some of the earliest temples in the world. For the first time, there was a public square where people could get together and exchange ideas. There were also public worship buildings dedicated to the gods. It kind of sounds like the Ubaid were the first true civilization, doesn't it? Not the Sumerians. The Ubaid culture gets its name from Tel al-Ubaid. It was one of their towns discovered in the early part of the 20th century in southern Iraq. From 1919 until 1937, there were periodic excavations. During the excavations, archaeologists continued to find bizarre lizard statues. You might be thinking the statues could be effigies of a mysterious lizard god, but that doesn't seem to be the case. There are male and female statues. They look just like ordinary figures, but in reptilian form. What I mean is that the figures are typically in perfectly normal poses. For example, a female lizard creature breastfeeding a small lizard baby. In fact, it almost looks like images of the Virgin Mary with the infant Jesus. The reptilian beings have almond-shaped eyes and pointy faces. They even have elongated heads, just like some ancient Egyptian royalty. It's been over a century now, and archaeologists are no closer to finding the truth of the reptilians. Do these figurines represent aliens who came to Earth? Are the reptilians real? Let me know your thoughts in the comments, and hit subscribe while you're at it! Humans and Neanderthals New evidence has revealed something shocking about our prehistoric past. By our, I mean you and me, as homo sapiens. 
Scientists from the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology discovered proof that humans lived alongside Neanderthals 45,000 years ago. They weren't just neighbors, they were neighbors in the frigid north of Europe. All those years ago, during what's known as the Ice Age, the average temperature was way colder than it is now. The temperature in Europe was similar to the temperature in the coldest parts of the world like Siberia and northern Scandinavia. In this frozen tundra, Neanderthals and early humans lived alongside some of the fiercest predators ever. Creatures like hyenas and cave bears would have competed with human hunters for food. But this isn't news, is it? When you think about ancient humans and Neanderthals, don't you picture them fighting saber-toothed tigers and braving snowstorms in their bare feet? The truth is, scientists didn't think Homo sapiens developed a resilience to cold climates until much more recently. Humans came out of Africa, meaning they were used to much warmer environments. But when archaeologists excavated an ancient cave near a German town, they found evidence of prehistoric people, evidence like stone blades and other tools. These discoveries prove that Homo sapiens ventured into areas so cold they would have gotten frostbite if they weren't bundled in heavy furs. Excavations in 2022 revealed what scientists were silently hoping to find, ancient human fossils. Now they can confidently say that humans and Neanderthals braved the frigid cold together. It's also confirmed that humans reached northern Europe before Neanderthals went extinct. But why? Could it be that Homo sapiens were on the warpath, chasing Neanderthals to the edge of the world to drive them to extinction? Or is it like scientists think, and they were just breeding and coexisting together? After all, what else would humans and Neanderthals do in their chilly cave homes all winter? Underwater geoglyphs. A strange story appeared in Canadian news media in 2013. A guy named Rob Antill, not an archaeologist or a scientist, purchased a new drone with a video camera. He took his drone down to Kootenay Lake near the British Columbian town of Nelson. As he flew his drone over the edge of the lake, he was shocked to see underwater geoglyphs. After Rob uploaded the video, people started calling the geoglyphs the Canadian Nazca Lines. The video was impressive, seeming to show geoglyphs made by an unknown society in Canada. The potential for this mystery culture to have ties with the Nazca of ancient Peru was hugely exciting. Just imagine if geoglyphs from South America could be tied to geoglyphs in Canada. It would truly change history. Unfortunately, the drone footage turned out to be a lot less exciting than it appeared. In the spring, when the water level of the lake fell, a group of people created a labyrinth at its edge. This happened a few years ago, not a few centuries ago. The geoglyph isn't a geoglyph, and it isn't ancient. But why create a labyrinth at the edge of a lake? It's something that's becoming more and more popular. Labyrinths are a type of walking meditation that people sometimes carve into the sand or build out of rocks. They look like geoglyphs, but are used for quiet reflection and connecting with your inner self. Labyrinth builders believe that walking through the spiral mimics the complexities of the human brain, allowing a person to really meditate. Thanks for watching. Be sure to stay tuned for extra content you might have missed. Iron and Steel The advent of iron was a game-changer when it came to the advancement of technology during ancient times. People in parts of Africa and Asia first discovered its usefulness around 1500 BC, when they started harvesting it from the ground and making tools and weapons with it. 500 years later, cultures throughout Europe began catching on. Warfare helped the use of iron spread even further, particularly among the Celts who were known for their high-quality weapons. Iron made life a lot easier at a time when people didn't live very long. It came in especially handy when it came to farming, with tools like iron sickles and plows working much more efficiently than what people used before. With iron, farmers could work tougher soils, and it cut their working time so that they were free to do other things. Many people spent this newfound free time making trade goods such as salt, clothing, and jewelry. The development of steel-making technology was a groundbreaking feature of the Iron Age. Made with iron and carbon, steel is much harder than just iron, and it made very durable weapons. Most research put the end of the Iron Age at around 550 BC, but it varies by region. 
The rise of the Vikings around 800 AD marked the end of the period in Scandinavia, and in Western and Central Europe, the Iron Age ended around the same time that the Roman Empire fell during the 1st century BC. From the Iron Age up until the Industrial Revolution, the iron and steel-making processes and the tools that were manufactured stayed mostly the same. Mixing of Hominids Between 40 and 60,000 years ago, our ancestors got down and dirty with two closely related hominid species, the Neanderthals and the Denisovans. In fact, the only people on the planet who don't have any Neanderthal DNA in them are from Africa. But figuring this out didn't bring scientists anywhere close to fully understanding our evolutionary history. A study that came out last year found that the Neanderthals and Denisovans interbred with a mysterious population of ancient hominids in Eurasia roughly 700,000 years ago. This super archaic species diverged from other humans around 2 million years ago and numbered somewhere between 20,000 and 50,000 individuals. During this period, ancestors of modern humans separated from the ancestors of Neanderthals and the Denisovans, and large-brained hominids emerged in Europe and Asia. Scientists drew these conclusions by examining DNA from these archaic populations, as well as modern Africans and Europeans. At its most basic level, the research shows that human populations mated far more often than scientists previously thought, according to anthropologist Alan Rogers. It's the latest of many discoveries in recent years that present more questions than answers, but it still gets us one step closer to untangling the complicated web of our collective past. Troy and the Trojan Horse were real Ancient Greek philosopher and poet Homer wrote about the Trojan War in his epic poem The Iliad, but he failed to mention the Trojan Horse. According to the Aeneid by fellow ancient Greek Virgil, the decade-long series of conflicts ended when Odysseus ordered his army to build the famous structure. Some of the best Greek soldiers crammed into the hollow vessel, and Odysseus fooled the Trojans into thinking it was a peace offering. Once inside the city walls, the Greeks emerged from the wooden horse and ravaged the Trojans, securing their victory in the seemingly endless war. For a long time, experts believed that Troy was a mythical place dreamt up in Homer's mind. German archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann proved them wrong during the late 19th century, when he found and excavated much of the city in modern-day Turkey. This discovery posed a new question. How much of the stories about the Trojan War are true? Even after Troy's existence was proven, many scholars continue to doubt that there was ever really a Trojan horse. They thought that Virgil's reference to it was metaphorical in nature, perhaps relating to a natural disaster or a war machine, but not a big, clunky, literal wooden horse. Fast forward to this year. Archaeologists at Troy began digging up dozens of strangely positioned wooden planks, with each beam measuring up to 49 feet long. The structure fits Virgil's description of the Trojan horse, and radiocarbon dating revealed that it was built sometime during the 12th or 11th century BC, which falls in line with the recorded dates for the Trojan War. So, is it the Trojan horse? Scientists haven't confirmed it, but all signs point toward this being the case. And it kind of makes you wonder if there are any other true stories out there that experts are mistakenly labeling as mythical. Atlantis, perhaps? Arctic Dinosaurs The world was much warmer 70 years ago than it is now, but the polar regions still saw below freezing temperatures and snowy winters. Believing that dinosaurs couldn't survive in these frigid conditions, scientists long assumed that the creatures never stayed in these areas year-round. But they recently proved themselves wrong with the discovery of fossils from seven dinosaur species that were found as far north as 250 miles above the Arctic Circle. Some of the fossils are of eggs, suggesting that dinosaurs spent the winter in the region. Evidence of polar dinosaurs has also appeared in the southern hemisphere. These findings challenge the long-standing notion that all dinosaurs were cold-blooded. In order to survive in the Arctic, a species had to be at least somewhat warm-blooded, meaning that they were capable of warming their bodies enough to survive months of darkness and cold. Scientists are still piecing together the picture of what life was like for polar dinosaurs. It would have been especially hard for those really close to the poles, where darkness set in for six months every year and plant life ground to a halt. The condition would have possibly created a food crisis for any animals living there, unless they relied on a survival strategy that experts haven't identified yet, which, as things currently stand, seems entirely possible.
So, how do you think these Arctic dinosaurs lived and survived close to the poles? Were they warm-blooded? Were they hibernating? Or do you think there's a different answer to this mystery? Let me know in the comments below! And be sure to subscribe if you haven't already! We've got lots more videos coming up! The Early Human That Wasn't In 1912, an amateur archaeologist named Charles Dawson claimed that human-like fossils were found in East Sussex, England. The country's top paleontologist announced that the newly discovered bones constituted a previously unknown human ancestor who lived around 500,000 years ago. Experts described the species as the link between humans and apes. These claims were turned on their head in 1949, when new technology showed that the remains were no more than 50,000 years old. By then, modern Homo sapiens had already emerged into existence, meaning that the Piltdown Man, as he had come to be called, couldn't possibly represent a missing link between us and apes. Further investigation proved that the fossils were bones from two different species, a human and an ape of some sort, perhaps an orangutan. And the artifacts had been stained to look like they matched the gravel at Piltdown. Soon enough, the verdict was in. The Piltdown man was nothing more than an elaborate hoax. But why would someone go so far out of their way to lead science astray from fact? The first evidence that humans evolved in Africa came in the form of Homo erectus fossils that were discovered there in the late 19th century, shortly before the Piltdown Man appeared. But pervasive racism made many Europeans feel threatened by the growing body of evidence supporting this claim. By creating the illusion of the Piltdown Man, Europeans could claim that Britain played a prominent role in human evolution and that white people had evolved separately from black people. This is a huge problem in archaeology and history in general that is recorded by the victor and the most powerful people in society at the time. So when things don't go their way, they tend to twist or quash the truth. Many modern scholars argue that this is why people don't believe that ancient people could have been smart, and so amazing things from the past must have been created by aliens. Women could be Viking warriors Sometime during the mid-10th century, a high-ranking Viking military leader died and was laid to rest with two horses and an array of deadly weapons in what is now Birka, Sweden. When the grave was excavated in 1889, archaeologists simply assumed the individual was a man. But in 2014, osteologist Anna Kjellström noticed that the skeleton had delicate hip bones and feminine cheekbones. In 2017, a DNA analysis proved that the person was actually a female, an elite professional warrior who also happened to be a woman. She was at least 30 years old when she died and was around 5 feet 6 inches tall, which was tall for a woman of the time. In addition to her weapons and horses, the burial contained a board game, complete with playing pieces. Some experts think that this may symbolize her role as a war strategist. But not all researchers agree on this, or on the woman's role in her society. For now, though, most scholars seem to agree that the burial represents the first genetic proof that Viking women could be warriors. Early Trigonometry the ancient Greeks are widely credited with inventing the foundations of modern trigonometry, but a recent study suggests that the Babylonians may have used it 1,500 years earlier. The research examined a strange series of numbers on an ancient clay tablet fragment known as Plimpton 322. Created in ancient Mesopotamia between 1822 and 1762 BC, the bizarre artifact has perplexed experts ever since its discovery. In 1945, researchers said that the tablet appears to contain evidence of a primitive form of trigonometry, but until recently, that's as close as they got to figuring it out. As part of the new study, Australian mathematician Daniel F. Mansfield sought to prove his theory that this type of math was developed for marking the boundaries when ownership of private property first came into practice. He found answers in Psi 427, a tablet that was made in Iraq sometime between 1900 and 1600 BC. It describes the sale of a plot of land and contains extremely precise information about its boundaries. Coupled with Plimpton 322, it appears as though the Babylonians developed geometry for creating accurate perpendicular lines. Mansfield backed up his claims with support from cultural texts, including a description of a senior scribe scolding a junior scribe for calculating dimensions improperly. See? Just like school today! 
While Mansfield's hypothesis remains unproven, it presents a solid argument justifying more research into the possibility that the Babylonians preceded the Greeks with their mathematical developments. If this happens to be the case, then it would attribute the beginnings of trigonometry to an entirely different culture and set its origins back over 1,000 years. First Nocturnal Dinosaur Around 65 million years ago, a strange genus of theropod dinosaurs called Shuvuya roamed the desert in what is now Mongolia. These creatures came from the same group of dinosaurs that gave rise to modern-day birds. The only known Shuvuya species is Shuvuya deserti, which means desert bird. It was about half the size of a chicken with long legs, a fragile skull, and powerful arms equipped with single claws. Scientists have long known of the species' existence, but they only recently realized that it may have been the first dinosaur to hunt at night. A team member noticed that the creature's lagina, an organ that processes hearing, was unusually long. The team compared the species with CT scans of around 100 living birds and extinct dinosaurs. They also measured each species' scleral rings, which are the bones surrounding the pupils, to determine which animals were more likely to have operated in low light. They were surprised to learn that the barn owl, a nocturnal species with excellent hearing, was the only creature with a comparably long lagina to the Shuvuya. The Shuvuya's scleral ring was large in diameter, meaning it let in a lot of light and perhaps enabled the animal to hunt in the dark. The creature's remarkable hearing helped it locate burrowing insects and small mammals. Then, it seized its prey by digging in one of its two large, singular claws. Several of the Shuvuya's traits, including nocturnal activity, digging ability, and long hind limbs, are also seen in modern-day desert animals. The team also learned that most dinosaurs were primarily daytime creatures, and that predatory dinosaurs typically had good hearing compared to most birds. Mediterranean Whales Killer whales, also called orcas, are not known to frequent the Mediterranean today. In fact, not many whale species, period, are typically seen in the region, and none are known to breed there. Yet around 2,000 years ago, during the first century, Pliny the Elder wrote about killer whales hunting whale calves near the Strait of Gibraltar. He described how the orcas viciously slaughtered mothers and their young in the Bay of Cadiz. Because there are no killer whales in that area today, some researchers assumed that Pliny was mistaking dolphins for orcas. But a 2018 study suggests that he may have been spot on with his observations. The research describes the discovery of bones belonging to North Atlantic right whales and Atlantic gray whales, which were found among the ruins of an ancient Roman fish processing facility along the Strait of Gibraltar. Unearthed in the ancient Roman city of Baelo Claudia near modern-day Tarifa, Spain, the evidence fits almost perfectly with Pliny's claims. Now, experts wonder if the Romans hunted whales, along with the tuna and other large fish they were known for harvesting. Ancient fishermen didn't have the technology to hunt large whales on the open sea, but they may have taken advantage of the opportunity to kill them while they were close to shore, according to lead study author Ana Rodriguez. She further explained that the study shows how even heavily studied regions still contain surprises from the past leaving one to wonder what else has been lost to history, or perhaps is still waiting to be discovered in places like the Mediterranean. Howard Carter, Tomb Raider Shocking new evidence is changing everything we know about the famous discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb in 1922. Howard Carter was the famous archaeologist who uncovered the tomb of the boy pharaoh. A lot of stuff happened during the excavation process 100 years ago. A terrible curse was allegedly unleashed upon all of those involved, and many of those people did suffer great misfortune following the opening of the tomb. But there was also a rumor that Howard Carter was less of an archaeologist and more of a tomb raider. Those rumors have always been around, but Carter propelled himself to such blistering fame that it never really bothered anyone. Now the rumors appear to be true. The accusation is a simple one. Howard Carter allegedly pillaged the tomb of Tutankhamun before the vault was officially opened. He went in by himself, took all of the greatest relics he could find, and smuggled them out in secret. He stole the greatest archaeological wonders within, and then either sold them for profit, gifted them to friends, or kept them for himself. In 1934, British scholar Sir Alan Gardner, a man who had been enlisted by Carter to translate hieroglyphics, 
wrote a letter to Carter discussing artifacts which had been stolen from the tomb. This letter was only recently published, and it clearly shows that Howard Carter pillaged the tomb for his own personal gain. A man who was believed to be such a great archaeologist has now been confirmed as a scheming thief. Taming Fire The oldest indisputable evidence of humans wielding fire dates back about 400,000 years. This evidence was found in Israel in the Qasem Cave. Here, archaeologists discovered evidence of both Homo sapiens and Neanderthals controlling fire. But now, a new discovery has just been made that's totally changing the history of humans and flame. An international team of researchers discovered traces of campfires from one million years ago in South Africa. Inside the mysterious Vandervert Cave, a place where early hominins lived for a span of about two million years, researchers found charred animal bones and the ashy remains of plants. They also came across scraps of stone tools that may have been used by one of humanity's greatest ancestors, Homo erectus. Archaeology professor Francesco Berna from Boston University says the evidence in the cave suggests humans were not the first primates to control fire. Instead, Homo erectus clearly had some familiarity with the element. This could push taming fire all the way back to 1.5 million years ago. It's extremely difficult to say for sure, but it does appear that we were not the first intelligent primates. Yes, we came out on top, but even our distant relatives had already figured out how to use fire. There are some experts in the field, like primatologist Richard Wrangham, who believe using fire and cooking meat allowed our ancestors to get more calories. More calories allowed them to develop larger brains, which pushed evolution forward. The first settlers One of the earliest villages in the world was just found in Turkey. It's 11,400 years old, and it's changing what we know about human history. Let's start with the site itself. It's called Karahan Tepe, and it's located near the Syrian border. Archaeologists uncovered ancient homes, ritualistic complexes, and evidence of humans settling down at least 2,000 years before the development of agriculture. According to Nekmi Karul from Istanbul University, the site shows a dramatically different view of history. Before now, it was agreed that humans settled because they discovered agriculture. Learning how to grow crops forced people to become stationary, throwing away their nomadic existence for the lives of rural farmers. But now that doesn't seem to be the case. The megalithic complex of Karahan Tepe was built by hunter-gatherers long before they ever thought about growing crops. And here's where things get really interesting. Karahan Tepe is located only about 20 miles from the UNESCO World Heritage Site of Gobegli Tepe. This other site is home to the oldest temple structures in the world, dating back about 11,600 years ago. There is some speculation that Gobekli Tepe is the original Garden of Eden, the first place built by human hands. If that's even remotely true, it could be that the builders of Gobekli Tepe, potentially a king by the name of Adam, spread his influence across the region and built even more cities. It's all very mysterious and is really challenging what we know about the beginning of civilization. A Mysterious Link Inside a dark and spooky cave in the Chinese province of Yunnan, scientists discovered some peculiar remains. Researchers with the Chinese Academy of Sciences studied the DNA of a skull that had been sitting in the cave for 14,000 years. It once belonged to a woman, a woman whose DNA proves she was an extremely close relation to the first population of Native Americans. Dozens of Paleolithic human bones have been found inside the Red Deer Cave in China since 2008. But until this most recent discovery, anthropologists have been confused. They couldn't figure out who these remains belong to. But now that scientists have managed to take a peek into the genetic structure, it's clear the residents of this cave were an unusual mix of both archaic and modern human characteristics. Here's the thing. These ancient people had DNA unlike others found in the Asian East. Their genes show a hybrid mixture of Native American blood as well as something far older, going into the realm of prehistory. There is definitely prehistoric DNA in the woman's bones, 
Ancient DNA found only in two modern subpopulations of people. She was closely related to people from southern China and Native Americans, but she also had lingering morphological features from more primitive species, such as the Denisovans. Studying the data will help paint a more complete picture of how our ancestors migrated. It will also contain important information about how humans change their physical appearance by adapting to environments over time. Big shout out to Oswald Paul Barciana and Darlene Dubois. Thanks so much for watching. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe to join the Origins Explained family. The Old Testament In the heat-scorched badlands of the Arava Desert in Israel, there is an entire wealth of history. Scratched on rocks, there are hieroglyphics that date back 3,200 years. There are mysterious tunnels that vanish into hillsides and then collapse. Walls of stony cliffs have been marked by ancient bronze chisels. This means there were most certainly people here thousands of years ago, and traces of them can be found if you look deep enough. In 2009, archaeologist Erez Ben Yosef began excavating the copper mines of Timna. He and his team discovered evidence that 3,000 years ago, the entire area had been a vast industrial mining operation. This was the work of a highly advanced society, and yet they left almost nothing behind. The archaeologists never found any permanent structures, only forgotten copper deposits that had been sifted through by ancient people. All those chisel marks in the stone walls were from mining operations. And this is where things get biblical. According to the Old Testament, King Solomon was extraordinarily wealthy in minerals. He supposedly had a massive mining operation somewhere in the Israeli desert. The excavations at Timna appear to prove beyond any doubt that there was indeed an Iron Age industrial landscape extending at the same time as Solomon's reign. It's interesting because it shows just how historically accurate the Bible can be. The Plague in the Sahara New evidence has revealed how the Black Death in the 14th century reached certain corners of the world that were previously thought to be unaffected. The plague killed about 50% of the population in some cities across Europe, Asia, and North Africa. But up until quite recently, researchers never believed the plague bacteria made it across the Sahara Desert. This is because written records from sub-Saharan Africa have no mention of any plague. There are no mass graves like the plague pits in Europe, and the European explorers of the later 15th and 16th centuries didn't write that they witnessed the disease. But this all could be false. Archaeologist and historian Gerard Chowin was excavating the ancient African city of Akrokroa in Ghana when he started to make some strange discoveries. The city was a farming community founded about 1,300 years ago. It lasted from the year 700, give or take a few decades, until the 1300s. At around the same time that the plague was spreading across Europe, this medieval African city was abruptly abandoned. And it wasn't the only one. The medieval city of Kirikongo in Burkina Faso was cut in half in the 14th century. From out of nowhere, half the population was gone. Archaeologists are now wondering if the plague did spread all the way across Africa, decimating the population in ways never before imagined. The Mysterious Origins of the Etruscans Scientists have finally uncovered the mysterious origins of the Etruscan people. But with this new discovery comes even more questions. The Etruscans were an advanced civilization that lived north of Rome. They were some of the first people the Romans fought in an attempt to expand Roman territory. The Etruscans had a highly complex culture, beautiful architecture, and had made shocking achievements in technology. But they ended up being swallowed by the Romans and forgotten for thousands of years. The last Etruscan cities were absorbed by Rome in 27 BC. For decades, scientists have been trying to figure out where the Etruscans even came from. Their language dates back at least to 700 BC, but nobody has ever been able to place it geographically. Even the ancient Greek historian Herodotus didn't know where the Etruscans came from and guessed they migrated into Italy from Anatolia. The big breakthrough came thanks to advances in DNA technology. Scientists finally extracted DNA from the skeletons of Etruscan people who were buried over 2,000 years ago. The DNA proved beyond any doubt 
that the Etruscans migrated into Italy from the Central Asian steppes during the Bronze Age in 6000 BCE. They came from around what is today Ukraine, likely evolved from an indigenous population. Even more interesting is that they were closely related to the Latins who lived in Rome from around 1000 BC until they were squashed, like the Etruscans by the Romans. Yet despite being so closely related by blood, the Latins and Etruscans looked different, spoke a completely different language, and had totally unique architectural styles and cultural ideologies. Rewriting Maya History Modern technology is currently allowing scientists to rewrite Maya history, along with help from a Canadian teenager with a wild theory. His name is William Gadori, and he came up with the theory that Maya cities were built based on coordinates of constellations in the sky. He developed the theory by using mapping applications like Google Earth to look at the exact coordinates of where known Maya cities are located. He then matched those cities to their respective constellations to come up with possible locations for lost cities. And he did all this when he was only 14 years old. As of 2022, William's lost cities still haven't been found and his theory hasn't been proved correct. However, it could happen any day. Scientists are just waiting to use light detection and ranging technology to search for William's alleged cities. This technology has already changed the way scientists look at the Maya culture. For example, research teams used to have to do everything on the ground. It could take years to cover a few square miles of rainforest. But with light detection and ranging technology, also known as LIDAR, entire areas of land can now be scanned in a very short period of time. Recent LIDAR scans have revealed lost cities in the Amazon jungle, lost farming villages belonging to the Maya, and much more. One of its biggest discoveries was a series of highways hidden underneath the foliage of the jungle leading from one Maya city to another. This was a big deal because until those roads were found, researchers all agreed the Maya didn't use roads. It was an accepted fact that the Maya transported everything using waterways because it was too hard to get through the forest. By using LIDAR, we now know that that was wrong. The Maya had long, complex roads and easily traversed the jungle. Ghost Footprints in the Americas Scientists recently discovered mammoth bones in North America that could very well change what we know about the arrival of human beings in the Western Hemisphere. Popular science says humans arrived in Canada across a land bridge that stretched from Asia to North America a maximum of 15,000 years ago. In a new study, mammoth bones found in New Mexico were dated at 37,000 years old. That's not totally unusual, seeing as there were plenty of mammoths back then. The unusual part is that the bones, according to researcher Timothy Rowe, show evidence of being broken by human tools. In other words, humans butchered these mammoths 22,000 years before they supposedly showed up in North America. That should be impossible. It pushes back human settlement in the Americas by more than most scientists are comfortable with. The Alchemists of Negev 6,500 years ago in Israel, a group of magicians used their knowledge of metallurgy to control the creation of copper. They potentially lured it over the locals who lacked the knowledge to properly extract metal from ore. Magicians, also called alchemists, were more real than people realize. They didn't actually have supernatural powers but they did possess knowledge which others did not. This knowledge was scientific, and it was so shocking to primitive people thousands of years ago that it appeared as though the alchemists were bending reality. Evidence of these alchemists was recently found in the Negev Desert of southern Israel. At the ancient site of Beersheba, archaeologists uncovered a copper smelting workshop dating back almost 7,000 years. It was powered by the earliest metal furnaces ever identified, these furnaces were the replacement for the smaller crucibles used earlier to extract metal. These furnaces would have been the pinnacle of technology of that period, and they were almost certainly owned and operated by an elite group of magicians. So how does this change history? It changes the way we understand the development of metallurgy. Basic metallurgy began being practiced roughly 7,000 years ago, but it wasn't that advanced, and the extraction of copper was extremely difficult. What we're seeing with this new site is one of the very first monopolies on a manufactured good, 
and the very first special recipe. It's like this secret recipe for Coca-Cola. An elite group in society took complete control over the most coveted material in a way that had likely never been done before. They then controlled that material until ordinary people figured out how to do it for themselves. Thanks for watching. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you soon for more videos like these. Bye!